Uh, we'll start off with a land grant acknowledgement. So the Cosin Institute at UCLA acknowledges the Gavrilina Tonga peoples as the traditional caretakers of the land of Tavangar, which is the Los Angeles Basin and the Southern California Channel Islands. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Honukvatong, the ancestors, Ahikaram, elders, and Iohinkim, our relatives or relations past, present, and emerging. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Allison Carter. Allison Carter is an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Oregon. She received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and has undertaken research in Southeast Asia since 2005. So everyone, please join me in digitally welcoming Dr. Allison Carter. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to join you virtually and share some of the research that I've been working on um, with a large group of people, including some names I see uh, on, the, on the attendee list here. Um, so uh, I'll just jump in and get started. Um, I do want to acknowledge the, these many collaborators. So I'm here um, presenting to you by myself, but this actually re represents a lot of work from many different individuals uh, and institutions and funding organizations, and we couldn't have done it without uh, their support. Um, and so I just want to make sure that I acknowledge um, that this is definitely a collaborative and team effort. Uh, and so here's the plan for today. I have this kind of um, two part talk. So I'll do a really brief introduction and background on Ampor, and then I'm going to jump into the people part of my talk. So I'm going to go from small scale to big scale and address um, what we know about urban occupation in Angkor and like what was daily like daily life like for non-elite people at Angkor. Uh, and as part of that, thinking about how do we identify domestic spaces at Angkor and then specifically talk about excavations that we've done at Angkor Wat. So that's the small scale part. And then the big scale part, uh, I'm gonna jump into answering this big question of how many people lived at Angkor and how did this change over time and present to you some brand new research on diachronic demographic modeling that we have been doing um, that actually a lot of our work at Encore Watt helped uh, as part of it. So I'll present that um, in the second half. So that's the plan. Um, so I think a lot of people here are already familiar with Encore. I didn't build in a lot of background in, um, into this, but uh, the Encore or Khmer Empire was the major power in mainland Southeast Asia from the 9th to 15th century CE. You can see a map here showing the extent of uh, what we believe to be the extent of the empire um, at its height in the 12th and 13th century CE. But of course, the main part of, um, main kind of heartland of Angkor was here in this area we call the Greater Angkor region um, near the Tonle Sap Lake in Northwest Cambodia. Um, and uh, this is where most of the archaeological sites are. Um, there are sites actually all over Cambodia, but uh, this is the place that you would, might be familiar with if you've been to Cambodia and visited as a tourist. Um, zooming in on that from that big map to this other map, this is a map we have of the Greater Angkor region, which encompasses about 3,000 square kilometers. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, is thinking about where are people living on this landscape and how um, occupation is uh, different in these different components and how this changed over time. As part of that, I just wanna introduce like two components of this landscape to start with. So we have the Angkor, what we're calling the Angkor metropolitan area, sometimes called the hinterland or this more rural agrarian part of the landscape. Um, but what you can see is that of course, this isn't an empty landscape. There's all these dots here and that's representing house mounds and temple sites, um, reservoirs, components of the water management network. Um, that are all important part of this greater Angkor urban settlement. And then we have what we're calling the Civic Ceremonial Center or kind of like downtown Angkor. This is the part that you visit as a tourist primarily, which has most of the stone temples of Angkor too. So I'll be using these terms throughout. Um, and this is what I'm referring to as the Civic Ceremonial Center. Sometimes I'm abbreviating it to CCC or the AMA, the Angkor Metropolitan Area, which is this more agrarian a lower density part of the landscape too. Um, of course, most of the research at Angkor has really focused on the Civic Ceremonial Center for over a hundred years. Uh, researchers have especially focused on inscriptions. Um, there's a lot of inscriptions that are on the temples themselves in stone or on freestanding stela. 
Uh, this gave us a lot of historical information, the name of rulers, kind of different events that took place over time, the dates temples were constructed or consecrated. Um, and then a lot of research has also gone into reconstructing a lot of the temples that were in fairly poor condition when they were um, uh, quote unquote discovered by the French in the 19th century, 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and also uh, thinking about art historical styles and using art history also to date and add a chronology to the Angkorian landscape. So this is really important and fundamental data about Angkor. Um, and I don't mean to, um, I'm not trying to um, uh, sweep it under the rug. This is really foundational work and it's been so important, but of course, it's really only telling us about one part of the landscape and one part of the population. It's really been focused on that civic ceremonial center and especially these elite spaces. And if we go back to this, um, flip back here to this map, you can see this is a huge area. And as I'm gonna tell you in the second half of our presentation, it was filled with hundreds of thousands of people. And so that's a part of the archeological research that's really been understudied and um, we haven't really known a lot about. And so that's what uh, I wanna focus on today. But there's some key questions about this, which is how do we, um, what do we know about where people were living at Angkor, the non-elite members of society, and how can we identify these spaces archeologically? This is a bit of a challenging question because as you can see from my image here, traditionally Angkorian residences, like a lot of residences in Cambodia today and also across mainland Southeast Asia, are made out of organic materials with their living space elevated above the ground on these posts or piles. And this doesn't preserve very well archaeologically. So uh, where, whereas the elite civic ceremonial center is so archaeologically visible and really very captivating, um, the places where people were living have been understudied partially because they've just been so difficult to identify and to study archaeologically. But there are some material signatures that we can think about identifying um, archaeological sites, and we can draw on different lines of evidence to think about what would an Angkorian residence look like and what can we look for in the archaeological record to try and understand where people are living and from there get a better idea about um, what, uh, what daily life was like for a lot of non-elite people. Um, so even though the architecture itself frequently doesn't preserve, there are parts of household architecture that we can look for in the archaeological record, so especially post holes are one thing we can look for. Um, there's also been some really interesting um, historical uh, documents uh, from this Chinese ambassador named Zhou Da Quan, who visited Cambodia in 1296 and 1297 AD. And he actually talked a lot about what he saw uh, as a visitor to Cambodia, including what people's houses were like. And he uh, mentioned that house size was related to status so that higher status people had larger houses and their larger houses had roof tiles. So this is a modern example, but you can see here is a nice large house with roof tiles. Um, whereas the houses of uh, lower status people would be made out of entirely organic materials and thatch roofs, um, and they would tend to be smaller. So this also gives us something we can look for in the archeological record in terms of trying to understand the status of people and their residences. Uh, looking for presence of ceramic roof tiles, for example, looking for post holes, we'd imagine that a house, a large house with a big heavy ceramic roof tile roof would have much larger posts that, to hold up the house and the roof as well too. So those are some material correlates we can look for. Um, we also associate food preparation a lot with um, daily activities of people and helping us identify residential locations. And as part of that, we can look for ceramics. So we know Joe Daguan, in fact, talked about how people in Angkor used earthenware ceramics for cooking. They also had portable stoves. So this is uh, an image from the bas relief on the Bayon temple showing a little ceramic portable stove here and people cooking over it. Uh, but there's also stoneware ceramics that we know were used for storage of things like food and alcohol and smaller covered boxes that people would have used for things like medicines or lime for betel chewing. So these ceramics can also tell us a bit more about the kinds of activities and uh, help us identify residential locations too. On top of that, um, we can look for evidence of Chinese tradeware ceramics. And uh, there's been some interesting archeological research indicating that Chinese tradeware ceramics and the quantity, having higher quantities of Chinese tradeware ceramics might be a good indicator of status as well um, that we can add to our, our mix. And then also we can think about um, kind of craft production at a household level and what we might see in a residential. I think you ended up muted, sorry. Oh, that's okay, I'm back. <laughs> I wasn't muted before though, right? Okay, good. Um, so just to go back and say, um, 
the craft production is also something that we could think of like household craft production and Zhou Zhuguan, this Chinese ambassador mentioned how there might have been um, cotton weaving or cotton textile production as something we might be able to look for. And then we know ethnographically that a lot of people had household gardens around their living spaces. And that's something that we can look for as well too with our botanical remains. Uh, and Zhou Duquan and um, also inscriptions on temples list a lot of the different kinds of plants and food that people would have been eating and donating to temples too. So we have a pretty good idea of what to look for in the landscape. Um, but where to look and then identifying these spaces has always been a challenge because of the reasons I just mentioned, like houses are made out of organic materials. A lot of this landscape around Angkor is covered by forests. So if we want to understand um, and study non-elite members of society and the people of Angkor, it's a challenge to find out where they were living and get this data. But uh, recent technological advances have really helped us start addressing this question. Um, and with that, we are, I'm talking about LIDAR. And I guess when I started doing this presentation several years ago, I had to do a lot of explaining about LIDAR because a lot of people didn't know what it was, but I feel like a lot more people nowadays have a familiar, kind of a passing familiarity of LIDAR. Um, basically, this is an airborne laser scanning technology. You can see this little animated um, image here showing a plane flying over a landscape and shooting out hundreds of thousands of laser points onto the ground surface and then it hits the surface of leaves and the roofs of houses and um, returns to the, um, the airplane or in our case, we used a helicopter or my colleagues used a helicopter that they flew over the Encore region. Um, what's cool is that because so many of these laser points are being, um, are being shot out of this uh, laser scanner is that uh, they can go through the gaps in the tree leaves and hit the ground surface as well too. And so what you get is a return that looks a little bit like this. Um, because people have been working with LIDAR for such a long time, we have a pretty good idea about what a tree signature looks like in a LIDAR return. And so what you can do is take the tree layer off and then get the ground surface underneath. And so using this LIDAR, we can suddenly kind of peel away the tree layer on the landscape and really better understand uh, what the ground surface looked like when a lot of these temples um, and living spaces were being constructed. So to give you a more specific example here, we have the temple of Angkor Wat from the air. You can see the large moat that goes around it, but you can see, again, this is really heavily forested uh, landscape. And so people are living here, it's very difficult to identify those spaces. With the LIDAR, we can peel this tree layer off. And what we have now underneath is a much clearer view of what the landscape of Angkor looked like. And you can see this is a really heavily planned landscape. This uh, kind of waffly pattern around the temple of Angkor Wat shows these lighter um, parts of the LIDAR that show the higher elevation areas, which we call mounds and then lower elevation uh, depressions or ponds. Uh, you can kind of see here too, how there's these linear features running through um, and this seems to be roads. So what we now have is a really clear view of this very well-planned orthogonal uh, landscape showing these mounds and depressions, places where we think we're living, people were living around the Angkor Wat temple. Um, but this isn't just at Angkor Wat. Um, all of the temples had this kind of occupation, um, orthogonally arranged um, uh, spaces of mounds and depressions around them. And this extended outside the temples too. So you can see these similar patterns, especially here. This is an area that we call the external Eastern enclosure and was a surprise to us. So this is right in line with the Angkor Wat temple. And you can see the same orthogonal pattern of mounds and depressions here too. So this seems like part of the same planned landscape also. Um, and what we can see is that now suddenly the places where people were living at Angkor are becoming much more visible. And just to give you another example, here's a LIDAR view of the walled precinct of Angkor Thom. And this, you can see again, a really beautifully, nicely arranged grid system of mounds and depressions within this enclosure and also outside of it too. Same with Top Prom, we have a grid system around the temple within the enclosure and extending outside of it. So now the LIDAR has really facilitated our ability to see where all of these people at Angkor were living. And what we can do as archeologists now is focus in on some of these areas and uh, start addressing these questions of what did their residences look like? What does urban occupation look like at Angkor? And so I'm gonna share with you work from one of our excavations that we've done um, at Angkor Wat. And this was part of the Greater Angkor Project who had a goal of 
trying to identify and better understand the residential spaces, especially within temple enclosures uh, inside of Angkor, inside of the civic ceremonial center. So um, just to again, highlight how transformative LIDAR has been for this work. Um, I wasn't part of the 2010 team that was working at um, Encore, but my colleagues who worked there um, were working without LIDAR data in that first field season. And they did this heroic job of battling through the thick trees and mapping these mounds and depressions. And you can see the map they came up with here. And you can sort of see that they're seeing a patterning in the mounds and depressions, but it's really difficult work to do this kind of ground survey. And then the same, here's the same area with the LIDAR survey. And now you can see much more clearly this very clear grid system of mounds and ponds um, that we can gather from the uh, LIDAR data. So it's been really helpful for this kind of work that we've been doing. Um, I hope you can see this. Um, these are a little bit hard to see. I realize they're kind of small, but um, the green mark the trenches that the 2010 team put in on some of these mounds. And that was because our initial hypothesis was that these were places where people were living, but we needed to do the work. We needed to do the on the ground work to identify that. Uh, and so there was this initial field season in 2010 and then went back in 2013 once we had LIDAR data and were able to both excavate on mounds um, inside the enclosure and then in this external eastern enclosure as well too. And you can see the locations of our trenches. And so the we mostly put in one by two meter trenches trying to get coverage across this eastern part of the Angkor Wat enclosure, which was better preserved than this western part over here, which is where you typically enter as a tourist to visit Angkor Wat. Um, and we really wanted to just identify the nature and timing of these mounds, the use of these mounds, and um, see if test our idea that these were places where people were living. Um, what we found were uh, that there seems to be layers, these three layers of occupation, um, and based on radiocarbon dates and ceramic data, um, we identified that these different layers are associated with different phases of use. So our layer three is associated with initial mounds construction and our radiocarbon dates come back to 11th or 12th centuries. Um, and then the primary uh, phase of occupation on top of the mound seems to be our layer two. And then uh, what we have is actually a short break in our radiocarbon dates where we think that there might be an abandonment or a transformation in the use of the mounds. The intensive habitation that we see during the 12th and 13th centuries seems to stop um, until about the 15th century or so, and then we have a reoccupation or reuse of the mounds, although with less intensive habitation. Uh, and so we actually talked about this in another publication. So if you're interested in learning more, I'd be happy to share that with you. Um, but what I'm gonna to talk to you today mostly is the what we found in the, our layers two and three, um, the Angkorian part of the occupation. So um, this work was really great. It gave us a great idea that these mounds are places where people are living, but of course, in order to, get a better idea about what's happening on the mounds, the spatial distribution of activities, try and identify more about an architectural house structure, identify things like post holes, what a house form might've looked like. We needed to do a larger horizontal excavation. This is a bit tricky because as I mentioned, there's a lot of trees in this area and uh, we didn't want to, nor could we cut down trees um, or at least large trees. There were some saplings that we were able to cut down, but uh, we needed to find a mound that was fairly open and also uh, termite mounds are very common in this area and those can really bioturbate our stratigraphy and make excavation pretty difficult. So we wanted to find a mound that was fairly open, didn't have a lot of trees where we could try and do this horizontal excavation and also didn't have too many termite mounds. And so we picked one particular mound that we had excavated in 2013. It was this one here. We had put one trench in and we found a lot of ceramics, a huge dump of ceramics. So it seemed really promising and it was fitting these other qualifications. So we went back in 2015 to do a mar larger, more horizontal excavation. We started in dropping a bunch of one by two meter trenches across different parts of the mound. And then as we were finding features, we were following those features and expanding our trenches. Um, and then we were a bit restricted on how large we could get because of the trees and the termite mounds that I mentioned earlier. But you can see in one part, the eastern part of the mound, we really were finding a lot of features. And that's where most of our data is coming from. So I will go over now some of the things that we found. Um, here's an overhead view of some of those trenches. What you can see right away is uh, we were finding a lot of these flat pieces of sandstone, which I'll come back to, and as well as um, this kind of uh, fired clay and some brick that was coming up as well too. We were also finding some postals, which are a bit hard to see from this picture. So I put an outline here as well too. Um, this is a possible hearth feature. I'll be talking about that more also. Uh, so these are some of the, this is like one example of some of the um, uh, features that we found. 
We didn't uncover enough of a horizontal area to get a complete outline of a house and get an idea about what the size was. I will mention that while we were excavating, some of our Khmer field crew thought we were excavating a patea bai or a kitchen annex or small kitchen structure that might be off of a main house structure, um, which is possible because we were finding, we think, evidence for possible food preparation here and over here, which I'll talk about in a second also. Um, so uh, I'm gonna show you also, this is a little bit, uh, this is another drawing kind of flipping this one, uh, we were looking this way is north and then to flip it around this way, you can see uh, a larger series of some of the trenches and uh, some of the post holes that we were finding. So I do think we were getting part of house architecture. Uh, and then you were seeing that there's a lot of these flat lying sandstone pieces. And so I think that um, our working hypothesis is that these might be some kind of floor surface or path that would run underneath or around this raised house structure. All right, so uh, the sandstone pieces are interesting because we think they are probably coming as cast offs from the construction of the Angkor Wat temple and then getting recycled into these house mounds. And so we actually found this in some of our other um, excavations in our earlier field seasons that other mounds were reusing some of these sandstone pieces. And some of the best evidence that these were probably from the construction of the temple or that we found a few pieces that had decorations. So here's one we think might have been part of this window feature. Here's another one you can see that was partially decorated and maybe broken and cast aside. And then people who were living there were taking these pieces and reusing them on their mounds. The ceramics we were finding do seem a lot of them to be related to food production. So we were finding about half of our ceramic assemblage of ceramic earthenware ceramics that we think were related to food production. But we were also finding a few other pieces that give us some other ideas about um, the uh, other kinds of activities that are taking place. So this one in particular is pretty interesting. This is the, we think the tail of a zoomorphic uh, stoneware brown glazed vessel that was in the, originally in the shape of the elephant and this would be the tail end of it. And those kinds of vessels we think were frequently used to hold lime paste for betel nut chewing. This one is a Chinese tradeware ceramic that's in the shape of a chicken or a rooster. And you can see it has this hole in the side of its mouth um, or on its beak. And we think this was a water dropper, which would have been part of a Chinese scholar's writing kit. And so as part of their writing kit, they would have had a grinding stone and ink and then used the water dropper to drop water on their grinding stone to grind up their ink and use that for writing. Uh, we haven't found any other uh, other parts of a scholar's writing kit um, in our excavations, nor I think has it been reported in any excavations at Angkor. So we're not sure that this was actually being used for that purpose in this house. Nevertheless, this is a pretty unique and special piece, I think, and it might show that the people who lived in this house had access to ceramics that were more than just for functional purposes. Another really interesting piece and the only complete vessel that we found in our 2015 field work was this one, which was buried underneath uh, this, these flat lying sandstone floor surface. So you can see it um, coming emerging in our one of our trenches over here. Um, I don't know how well this is coming through on Zoom, but this also had a potter's mark that's kind of in a trident shape here. So you can maybe see that also. Um, and this is really interesting because uh, none of the other ceramics that we have found are complete like this. And this seems to have been intentionally buried upright underneath what we think is this floor surface or path around or underneath the house. And so one question we have is, is this representative of some kind of domestic ritual practice? Um, we know that deposits were an important part of the construction of temples and having ritual deposits. Um, so we wonder if maybe this might be related to some kind of domestic ritual practice. Of course, uh, we have a sample size of one right now, so we need to do more work to see if this was a more widespread practice, um, but it's a pretty interesting piece and it's a stoneware vessel that we think was made at kilns that are close to uh, Phnom Penh, so uh, outside of the immediate Angkor region. Um, these are our two likely food preparation areas. Um, so you can see this one was destroyed and there's a little post hole here, but you can see this fired clay and sandstone also. Um, and we did take some soil samples from this feature and we found rice, cotton fragments, fruit and nut fragments as part of this. While we were excavating this particular feature, I'll say that there was a Khmer archeology span student from the Royal University of Fine Arts who commented that the fired clay that we were finding looked a little bit like when people are boiling palm juice to make palm sugar. And so nowadays in Cambodia, um, when people do this, they usually have um, a large vat and they take the juice of the 
they take this palm juice and essentially boil it down and to make this kind of really nice uh, sweet um, palm sugar. And uh, as part of that, they usually set their large vessels on these big earthen stoves. Um, and she was commenting that maybe this looked like uh, some of that, uh, those big earthen stones. And I will say that in our phytoliths, um, we also did find phytoliths associated with the palm family, although we don't know exactly what species, but this is a, a possible hypothesis. Um, this area is also really interesting. So hopefully you can see this circle of sandstone pieces and there's one little piece of brick here. And this also, um, when we identified it on top of this feature was a bunch of dark soil that had lots of charcoal and broken ceramics as part of it. And um, our phytoliths from this feature show cucurbits, banana, and also palm. We haven't had the macro remains from this feature identified, but we do think this is a hearth area. And Zhou Daguan, the Chinese ambassador to Angkor, did mention that people who would often cook by placing these three stones in a ground um, like a hearth. And so uh, this seems to kind of be following along that, uh, that description. Uh, to talk a little bit more about the macrobotanical remains, this is work done by my colleague Christina Castillo, and this was pretty recently published. Uh, and we have found some really interesting plant remains that are probably both related to daily consumption of food, as well as um, materials or food products that would have been donated to the temple as part of their ritual um, practice. And that includes rice and mung bean and banana. Uh, we have found both rice spikelet bases and husk fragments, which indicates that rice was being processed on the site. And Zhou Daguan again talks about how people would use a mortar and pestle to husk and process rice. Um, we haven't found mortar and pestle at Angkor Wat, although we did find a stone mortar in our excavations at a different temple site, the enclosure of temp uh, Taprom Temple. Um, however, a lot of mortars are actually made out of wood, so it's entirely possible there was a mortar and it just hasn't been preserved. Um, as part of her research, uh, Christina was trying to determine what kind of rice farming systems were practiced, and so she looked at the weeds associated with rice agriculture, and she was able to find weeds from both wet and dryland cultivation. So it makes it unlikely that there was rice being grown in the temple enclosure, but it, the diversity of all the weed plants associated with these different rice cultivation methods indicate that perhaps rice was being brought in from different environments. And we do have inscriptional evidence from other smaller temples that talk about there would be communities in different parts of the landscape that would be supporting the temple and um, probably bringing in rice from these different areas. So it's possible something similar was happening here. Although we don't think rice was being grown in the temple enclosures, there's, uh, I think, pretty convincing or pretty good evidence, at least from the macro botanical remains, that there might have been some horticulture practiced. And so both the actually macro botanical and micro botanical remains show evidence for banana, palm trees, black and long pepper, and crepton. Crip ginger, which um, are common parts of household gardens nowadays and in an ethnographic record. Our, we did have uh, Dr. ZJ Zwang come look at our, um, our trenches and try and identify perhaps potential garden areas on the mound. And he wasn't able to find anything convincing, but that might also be related to our excavation strategy, which was really focusing a lot on these features and less on areas where there might have been garden uh, gardens as well. But we do know from ethnographic records that household gardens would be an important part of um, of a household and uh, we think the macro botanical and micro botanical remains suggest that this could be happening at Angkor Wat as well too. I think uh, some of related to this, I think some of the most exciting evidence that has, was otherwise archaeologically invisible was the identification of uh, cotton. And so we have um, cotton seed fragments that seem to point towards the processing of cotton within the households here and we think is related to textile production. Um, Joe Daguan did mention that this was a craft activity taking place at Angkor. And interestingly, we have found cotton in both Angkor Wat and at our other temple enclosure site of Taprom. So one question we have is like, is this an important part of the domestic economy for people living inside of temple enclosures? How widely was this practiced? We're not quite sure yet, um, but that this is happening at two different temple communities that actually date to two different time periods is pretty exciting. And like I said, this uh, craft production practice was something that was otherwise archaeologically invisible, but I think seems to have been important. And cotton would have been important for textiles for daily life, but also as part of um, ritual and donations to the temples as well too. So uh, just to wrap up this first part of the presentation on the people part of Angkor, our data from Angkor Wat uh, gives us some really valuable information, I think, about uh, a place to start at least thinking about what urban occupation was like at Angkor. 
Um, based on the post holes that we found, the real focus of the um, features on the eastern part of the mound, the rest of the trenches that we were looking at were just not as and seemingly intensively used parts of the mound. And uh, we were finding fewer um, quantities of ceramics as well too. Our hypothesis is that each one of these little mounds inside of Angkor Wat had one house on it. As part of their daily activities, we definitely see evidence for food preparation, but also now we think that weaving cotton and cotton processing seems to have been an important part of the domestic economy. It doesn't seem like they're growing rice, but it does seem like household gardens were really important as well too. Um, this last bullet point is the big question, right? Who is living here? And that's a huge question we don't have a clear answer to yet. Um, but uh, we strongly suspect that the people who are living around, immediately around the temple and within the temple enclosure of Angkor Wat were probably people who were working at the temple. Inscriptions just talk about a really large number of people who are living uh, and needing to work in the temple or who are associated with the temple. And so uh, it's highly likely, I think, that the people who were living there were probably working there. Um, we didn't find, we found really only a handful of roof tiles. And so it doesn't seem like there are really high status people with large houses and roof tiles in this area. But we were finding really interesting ceramics too, like that Chinese um, water dropper. So maybe these are not the poorest members of society, not the richest members of society, but um, an interesting mix perhaps, or kind of like, I don't wanna say middle-class, but kind of um, in between those two extremes. Uh, so this is ongoing work of, like I said, we have a sample size of one right now of, in terms of horizontal excavations at Angkor Wat, but it's giving us a really um, interesting idea. And as our, we build our data set, we can start asking kind of more robust anthropological questions. So um, that was my small scale people part. And now I'm gonna zoom us way out and talk about the population of Angkor and what, how our work at Angkor Wat actually can help us address this question of how many people lived at Angkor over time and where did they live. So um, I'll just mention this is brand new research that just got accepted to Science Advances. So hopefully in a few months this uh, will be coming out in Science Advances. And I have to again acknowledge I'm here presenting this, but actually a lot of this work was done by my colleague Sarah Clausen and we had so many collaborators on this paper because this really represents like 30 years of research at Encore, and we couldn't have uh, gotten to this modeling without all of the contributions of these individuals. So this is again, a really highly collaborative project. And what I'm telling you now is brand new information that will be coming out soon. Um, I also, again, have to acknowledge our collaborators on this with the Apsara National Authority and the many individuals who supported this project and, and um, institutions and organizations as well also. Okay. So um, how many people lived at Angkor? This is a big question. Um, Angkor is one of the world's largest pre-modern settlement complexes, but we just don't have never had a really comprehensive demographic study for all the reasons I just discussed, because it's so difficult to identify where people were living until very recently. And so these key parts of the demographic history of Angkor have not really been um, well investigated. So uh, the project, as I mentioned, is really bringing together multiple lines of evidence, about 30 years of research that includes historical archives and maps, measurements from multiple airborne LIDAR surveys, archeological excavation data, and machine learning algorithms that is giving us now this granular diachronic model of Angkor's population. So I already talked about uh, the Civic Ceremonial Center and the Angkor metropolitan area. I'll mention the embankments in just a second. Um, we needed to think about where are people living? Because each of these locations, uh, we had to consider how to try and estimate population in different ways in each of these locations. So we had slightly different methods. Um, so to the build up to giving you the population and numbers at Encore, I'm gonna actually kind of walk you through our logic and methods. And of course, these are discussed in a lot more detail in our publication. So I'm gonna be a little bit super superficial in how much detail I give you, just to give you an idea of what we were thinking as we were trying to estimate population. So, uh, we're looking at where, but we also have to think about when. And so um, in order to kind of peel apart that big map of Angkor, greater Angkor region that I showed you before, and think about how this landscape developed over time. 
So we divided the um, our time periods of Angkor into five periods, um, sort of arbitrarily, but kind of based on some major developments that were taking place. And of course, I don't have time to go through the whole history of Angkor, but I'll just um, mention on this table, we had our period one, which kind of captured the end of the pre-Angkorian period and the very beginning of what we think of as the Angkorian period associated with the ruler Jayavarman II when he was declared universal monarch in 802 CE. Um, he is associated with two early capitals, Mahendra Parvata, which is located on Phnom Kulen, and Hariharalaya, which is located just southeast of the later capital um, of Yasodharapura at Angkor, which is where you typically go as a tourist. Um, so that's our first period. Our second period is associated with the King Yashovarman I, and he moved the capital from Hariharalaya to near where the Temple of Phnom Bakeng is. It's a popular sunset spot if you've been to Angkor. Um, and he founded this in this site of Yasodharapura. Also during this period too is when we had a rival capital um, at Kokera Koke by Jayavarman IV, um, which was very short-lived. And then um, Rajendra Varman II returned the capital, returned um, to uh, Yasodharapura and set up near the temple of Prerup. Uh, and that's where the capital of Angkor stayed for several centuries being built on and expanded by subsequent kings. Um, Period three, there was this uh, kind of uh, competition for the throne and Suryavarman the first one. He was a very powerful king. He actually was um, did a lot of work expanding Angkor's borders and built several temples outside of the Angkor um, region, greater Angkor region. Period four is Suryavarman the second, who like his namesake also kept expanding the empire's borders, but is perhaps most famous for his construction of the Angkor Wat temple. And then our period five is associated with Jayavarman the seventh, who is, um, believed to be kind of Angkor's most prolific ruler, um, responsible for a lot of major construction within Angkor, including the walled precinct of Angkor Tom, the temple of the Bayan, Ta Prom, Preya Khan, um, other developments to the water management network, also um, formalized a lot of the road network, built many hospitals and constructed some temples outside of the um, empire as well too. So this is how we're uh, dividing our space up over time or dividing our chronology over time. So first, let's think about the Civic Ceremonial Center, where and when were people living there. Um, I already showed you the LIDAR data, so now we have a much better idea about where people are living because we have this great LIDAR data that shows us all these bounds that were um, all over the, both inside the temple enclosures and outside the temple enclosures. Um, what we did in order to break up the Civic Ceremonial Center is come up with these 17 diachronic zones. And of course, this is a bit complicated because as new kings were coming in and transforming the landscape, they were building and reorganizing what was there before. So some of these are estimates, and this is where we were really drawing on the wealth of knowledge from our co-authors and the decades of research that's been done here to try and estimate the approximate size and what we think would be the density of occupation in these earlier areas that have been destroyed or are now below the later, um, later areas. So just to give you an example, like we have initially the early royal palace area here, which is in this, um, this dashed circle we call um, four. Uh, this is later covered by the walled precinct of Angkor Tom. So uh, we had to use our best information to try and estimate, you know, how much, how, how many people would have been living here, the habitation, um, thinking about the time period that this particular area was used before it got covered over by Angkor Tom, which is what's visible now. So um, we, uh, some of this is definitely, you know, our estimates based on our, our best guesses, but drawing on a wealth of knowledge from our colleagues who've been working in this region for decades. Um, dating the landscape then, so trying to pull apart these diachronic zones, uh, is, is based on a lot of the inscriptional data that we have with these particular temples, as well as art historical data. So uh, we were able to, in many cases, uh, specifically date sometimes to the year, some of these temples that have inscriptions or at least to general time periods because of the art historical work that's been done at Angkor. Um, and then of course, we have lots of these features like the mounds, embankments and ponds that are all around these dated temples. And so uh, in many cases, we could use a relative system of grouping features. So for example, when I showed you Angkor Wat before, we could see there's these mounds within the temple enclosure and that eastern external eastern enclosure, we can associate these all together with the date for the Angkor Wat temple because they seem to be sort of part of the same planned landscape. So we went through really carefully within the Civic Ceremonial Center and doing the same thing with these different diachronic zones, um, parts of the Civic Ceremonial Center here. Okay, 
Then to start estimating population, this is where our work at Angkor Wat came in. So in some temple enclosures, uh, there's not discrete mounds, they kind of blend together. Um, that's true at Ta Prom, for example. But at Angkor Wat, if you remember from the LIDAR data, we had these really discrete mounds in this really nice waffle pattern. Each of those mounds was about 20 by 30 meters, so about 600 meters square. And then based on our excavations in 2015, I feel pretty confident saying that we have one household per mound. So we use this as a proxy. We just had to start somewhere. We can't see the actual house structures in the landscape, but we can see these mounds. And based on the data from Angkor Wat, we could estimate that, well, maybe in the civic ceremonial center, we can say 600 square meters is the size of a household and that is gonna include the house and the living space around it. How many people live in a house? That's another big question, right? We don't have uh, we don't have a lot of good data on this, but ethnographic data from more recent Cambodian um, ethnographies, as well as worldwide ethnographic data, um, has given us this number of five people per household. So essentially, what we now have is this equation of 600 square meters for a household times five people. And so, what we can do then is go through the landscape and start looking at the mounds that we can see that are visible that give us an idea about population density. Um, in some cases, we have to then kind of estimate that there's similar population density over here where we can't really see it anymore because it's underneath Angkor Thom, but we use the population density around Prey Rup where mounds are still visible to estimate at the Royal Palace. We're using this calculation. And then as, we, as the landscape was developing over time, adding onto this, using what we call the mound method. Um, and that's how we were getting our population estimates over time in the Civic Ceremonial Center. The Encore metropolitan area is a little bit more tricky because um, we just don't have the same kind of data. Um, we still used temples as an anchor point on the landscape, but very few of these temples in this Encore metropolitan area are dated either through inscriptions or art historical methods. I think about less than 10% of them. So um, what we have to do instead is uh, come up with some other methods. So um, my colleague, Sarah Clausen, um, developed this semi-supervised machine learning algorithm where they were taking dates and known attributes for 1,177 temples and then predicted their dates using these multiple linear regression and graph-based semi-supervised machine learning algorithm that had a 49 to 66 year average absolute error. And that's how we were able to date these other locations in the metropolitan landscape. And if you wanna read more about that, she published this earlier in 2018 um, and goes into a lot more nitty gritty about that particular method. Um, so we have dates now for these temples, um, but let's think about where people are living. This is not the same as the Civic Ceremonial Center where we have this nice, beautiful grid system. In some cases, there are still remaining mounds in this Angkor metropolitan area. In many cases, the mounds have been uh, destroyed, uh, partially probably mostly related to agricultural activities. And so um, what we have done instead is the way we were kind of grouping mounds with temples in the Civic Ceremonial Center is using a similar method in the Encore metropolitan area and trying to group the mounds that we can see um, with these particular temples and then associating uh, the dates accordingly. Um, then, oops, to estimate population, this is where things get a bit more tricky. And this is really us where Sarah has done a lot of the work. So I will summarize what she has done, but um, I apologize that I don't have the depth of knowledge to go into a lot more detail than this. Uh, so um, we know that these temples were the centers of communities. In some cases, we can see some of these uh, like mounds, more um, spaced out mounds, lower density habitations around the temples, but a lot of them have been are missing. And so the mound method that we were using in the Civic Ceremonial Center doesn't really work here. However, drawing on the temples that do have mounds, uh, Sarah and um, uh, especially um, Hansen uh, were, uh, Hansen and Ortman, or sorry, Sarah was using an algorithm that was originally derived, devised by Hansen and Ortman to provide spatial resolution to the population estimates. Um, and this algorithm assumes that density increases with the size of the occupation mounds. We again drew on ethnographic data that talked about how in a lot of Cambodian communities, a temple uh, a services about 100 families. And then we were saying about each household has about five people. So we were saying when we see a temple community on the landscape, that's about 500 people or a temple like this one on the landscape that there would be associated with about 500 people. Um, based on this understanding, 
They adjusted the Hansen and Ortman uh, algorithm, so the outputs have a mean population of 497. And then for temples without surviving occupation mounds, we assigned a population of 497 people. So I apologize, I can't speak to this in more detail. It will be in our publication, but essentially what you can, uh, the very oversimplified version of this is that when we identified a temple uh, like this in the Angkor metropolitan area, we generally uh, thought that there would be around 500 people that would be associated with that particular temple. Then the uh, third place where people were living were on embankments. And this is something I haven't talked about yet, but there were embankments, especially roads and um, embankments associated with canals and dikes all across the Angkor metropolitan landscape and integrating the civic ceremonial center with this metropolitan landscape. This is an example from Google Earth of a raised road that um, you can kind of hopefully kind of see here on the landscape and where people are living on top of it. And so this seems to have been a common habitation area for people at Angkor as well too. Um, there haven't been extensive excavations in this location, but there have been some uh, preliminary research that's identified scatters of domestic debris like ceramics on top of these embankments and then in the canals next to them and dark channels, or sorry, dark organic deposits. And so we think that this is another area of occupation that we have to also consider as part of our, um, as part of our methods. Um, dating them, uh, in some cases, parts of the hydraulic system are associated with the inscriptions. So there's really large water storage tank known as the East Barai that has an inscription associated with it that gives, a, gives us a date. But otherwise, we know that this um, water management network developed over time and um, some elements that can be dated and some can be indirectly dated based on um, their spatial and functional relationships to one another and their association with other kinds of other parts of the landscape that has been dated. And so we use these anchor points to then estimate dates for this embankment system that runs throughout of Angkor. Um, and then what we ended up doing was uh, of these embankments that are still uh, present, we were measuring the widest surviving part of those embankments and then estimating that the entire embankment was likely at that same width along its entire length. And then we used the mound method that we were using inside of the Civic Ceremonial Center, the 600 meter squared um, measurement to estimate um, the number of households that could have lived along those embankments as well too. Okay, so this is after all of that, that's all of that is to help you understand why we got the numbers that we did in this particular table. And you can see the growth of Encore's uh, population over time according to our model. So what we can see is that it took several centuries for Angkor's population to reach its peak and that population was growing in these different locations at different rates. So you can see during our period one, there's kind of approximately the same number of people living in each of these zones. However, by the 10th century, the population in the metropolitan area had quadrupled, had nearly quadrupled, and there was additional infrastructure that led to increased population on the embankments as well too. Um, so uh, what we are seeing is that like Encore's population is doubling in this very short amount of time. The metropolitan area continued expanding until period four when the population began to slow. And then in contrast, the civic ceremonial center is kind of um, growing quite slowly until the 11th century, period three. And then we see a big jump again in period five, which we associate with Jayavarman the seventh, the walled precinct of Angkor Thom and a lot of his building activities in the civic ceremonial center. So um, you can see over here, this growth over time. We actually think there's a lot of interesting historical reasons for why these growth rates happened and the way things were going at particular times. Um, and that's a, actually a separate publication that's currently under review right now, but hopefully will be published soon too, to give you a bit more information. Um, and then this is my, the fun part of this, uh, of this presentation is this um, animation that gives you an idea, a bit more of an idea about how things were growing on the landscape. So here we have a map of Greater Angkor. You can see um, this is Mahendra Parvata, Hariharalaya. This is another possible capital near what becomes later the West Barai. Over time, you can see additional features growing on the landscape. And these colors boxes relate to the population density in each of those locations. So you can see over time, the landscape is expanding. The Angkor metropolitan area is quite low dense. It has a lot of low density occupation, but you can see this downtown Angkor actually has quite high density location, um, um, habitation in it as well too. And then once we get to um, the last period, it really population density really explodes. 
uh, across the whole landscape, but especially in the civic ceremonial center. So um, I don't know, I think this is really cool. I really love this animation. Let's play it one more time. Okay, so um, just to kind of wrap things up, what we can see is that in the 12th to 13th century, our model is predicting between 700 and maybe up to 900,000 people inhabiting this 3000 square kilometer greater Encore region. And the range is based on the, uh, our kind of uncertainty about embankment populations. That's just not a part of the landscape that's been investigated very well um, archeologically. Um, and we suspect probably that density was decreasing the farther away people were living on these embankments from the civic ceremonial center. What's I think notable is that the lower end of this estimate is uh, really in line with a previous population estimate by our colleague Eileen Lustig. And she estimated 750,000 people based on the amount of rice that could have been produced in the region without irrigation. Um, but what we can see now, and I think what the benefit of this particular study is that we can really start looking at more fine grained detail how this landscape was developing over time um, and using all of this these multiple lines of data, decades of research in Encore, we are able to show the growth of one of the world's largest agro-urban centers. And we can really see how the landscape was transforming over time. So um, just to conclude, I think this really shows how dynamic the agro-urban urban form is, and that this also can provide a model for other comparative analyses of agro-urban settlements and their growth and decline over time. So um, that's all I have here. And thank you very much for your attention.